Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, evidence-based strategies for adolescent suicide prevention, and I'm going to talk about, I'm going to try to at least talk about practical things that uh, pediatricians can do um, within their own practices to try and identify and uh, get some of these youth to be a little bit safer. Um, like Antonio said, I clinically run a couple of programs in child psychiatry for kids who are at high risk for suicide. Um, and then that's also my focus in research. So I'm going to mostly, though, focus on um, clinical tools today versus research, but I will be talking about evidence-based strategies, again, that hopefully you can utilize in your own practice for kids who are at risk for suicide. And just to start out, I want to go over a couple of definitions. So what I'm talking about afterwards in the research makes sense, because I think there's often confusion about these terms. Um, a suicide attempt is defined as a potentially self-injurious behavior that the person engages in with at least some intent to die or to cause their own death as a result of that potential injury. And that's different than non-suicidal self-injury behavior, which is self-harm that is not done with intent to die, but has other purposes or functions, such as to reduce intense negative emotion um, for self-punishment. Uh, to reduce dissociation or, or numbness, but it's different than a suicide attempt, although both are associated with future suicide attempts and indicate that a teen is at high risk for suicide. And then self-harm is a term that gets used in the literature a lot that groups both of those things together and looks at self-harm or self-injurious behavior regardless of intent to die or not. And that's over time led to some confusion in the literature when studies are looking at these different outcomes, but moving forward, I just want to make sure you understand these terms as I refer to them for different reasons. Um, and just to give you kind of the, the lay of the land of the scope of the problem of adolescent suicide, um, we know that adolescence is a particularly high risk time and going from childhood to adolescence, the risk of suicide increases dramatically. Um, based on the latest data that we have, suicide is the second leading cause of death among 10 to 14-year-olds and the third leading cause of death among 15 to 24-year-olds. Sorry, did I say 10 to 14-year-olds um, and 15 to 24-year-olds? So it's a leading cause of death. Um, in 2019, based on the um, Youth Risk Behavior Survey, 18.8 or almost 19% of high school students reported seriously considering suicide. So that's getting close to one in five. And then in 2019, around 9% of high school students in the United States reported having made a suicide attempt. And so again, that's getting around one in 10, which is pretty high if you imagine a high school and then thinking about one in 10 students there having made a suicide attempt in the past uh, year or two. And then non-suicidal self-injury is not automatically um, surveilled every two years the way suicide ideation and attempts are. However, the last time it was looked at, rates of non-suicidal self-injury in the United States among high school students were also very high, um, and particularly among girls. 24% of adolescent girls um, reported having engaged in non-suicidal self-injury. So that's like one in four, um, which just kind of highlights the scope and, and severity of this problem. So during the pandemic, I'm sure everybody knows, and we all experience too, everybody's mental health declined uh, significantly, and in particular, adolescents. I think there's been a lot of studies coming out trying to understand the, the impact of the pandemic on adolescent suicidality. I would say things are still preliminary because it takes some time to go back retrospectively and really understand exactly what happened. But not surprisingly, the data that is out there now shows that there was an increase in death by suicide among adolescents during the pandemic and the, the year that people were in the more intense lockdown. There was an increase in emergency department visits, um, particularly among girls for suicide attempts. Um, and you probably are all aware that the organizations that serve adolescents, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, um, Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry all declared a national emergency in children's mental health. And we've certainly been feeling that in terms of demand for mental health services um, during the time of the pandemic and still now definitely feeling the impact of that. Um, so in terms of you know, why 
Uh, people in pediatrics should be concerned about this. Um, obviously, you're going to see a lot of these kids. And a pediatric visit provides a window of opportunity to identify kids who are at risk who may not come to mental health care. Um, and there's been multiple studies on this, but in one study, 86% of youth with suicidal ideation had a primary care visit in the past year, whereas only 13% of those had a mental health visit. So a pediatric visit provides a window of opportunity to identify some of these youth at risk who would not otherwise be seen by professionals. And of course, identifying these kids and getting them hooked up to the right um, intervention and care is a really important suicide prevention strategy. Um, so I looked at the latest recommendations for suicide risk screening by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And what they are recommending as of 2022 is for youth ages 12 and up, there's universal uh, screening for suicidality. So every teen who comes to see a pediatrician, they are recommending get some sort of screening to look for suicidality. Then the younger kids, 8 to 11, not universal screening, but the recommendation is when there's a clinical indication. And under 8, where suicide is much more rare, although not, not non-existent, um, there doesn't need to be screening routinely, but obviously if there's some indicator of risk, the, the clinician should do more screening. And then the, the recommended tool um, by the American Academy of Pediatrics, as well as NIMH, is this ASQ measure. Um, and the inpatient medical units here at LPCH have been using this for a couple of years now when they were mandated to start doing screening. Um, and I was involved in some of the training along with the psychiatrists on the CL service from child psychiatry in getting this, the nursing staff and social work staff and the medical inpatient units trained in using this tool. It's pretty straightforward. Um, it's a series of five questions. Um, ranging in severity in terms of have you, has the teen wished they were dead? Um, have they had thoughts about killing themselves? Have they ever attempted suicide in the past? And then if they answer yes to any of those questions, it goes to this question number five, which is looking at acute suicidality. And are you having thoughts about killing yourself right now? Um, if they're having thoughts about killing themselves right now, then we have, then this is the guidelines of how you respond to this measure. Um, if they're having thoughts about killing themselves right now, then the recommendation is to get a mental health professional to come in and do an immediate assessment. Um, if they say yes to the other questions, but not that they're suicidal at the moment, then there's another measure called the brief uh, suicide assessment where they can have a, what's called a low risk evaluation to determine what the next step is. And then obviously if they say no to everything, that's a negative screen and you don't need to do anything else. And then this screen, uh, the brief, um, I have to keep seeing different things, the brief suicide safety assessment is also, it's a companion to the ASQ. And this is something that a clinician would do, um, who would come in and do this non-acute screen. And this goes through a series of standard questions in terms of suicidal ideation. Is there a plan for suicide? What are the different supports that the and family have in place, what are symptoms and risk factors currently um, for suicidality or suicide attempt. And then based on that, the clinician can make recommendations um, about what the next step should be in terms of treatment, as well as there's a, a component of doing some basic safety planning. Um, and so we are, we are working in child and adolescent psychiatry to start setting up a screening program for suicide risk in some of the outpatient pediatric clinic. So I'm working along with uh, two other clinicians to start to implement screening. And then we're going to have clinicians who are available to then do this brief suicide safety assessment and determine what the next step would be, as well as for kids who um, endorse that number five, they're feeling suicidal at the moment, um, people who can write an involuntary hold and get those kids over to the emergency room for immediate evaluation. Um, I just want to say a little bit about non-suicidal self-injury behavior. So I think historically there's been confusion of what this behavior is or what it means. And for a while it got referred to as a suicide gesture or um, people would assume this is quote unquote attention seeking or this is manipulative behavior. There'd be a lot of sort of um, 
derogatory ways that people would talk about this or, or not take it seriously. But we know that there's a lot of emerging data showing that it's quite serious and it's a very strong predictor of um, future suicide attempts. Like I said, this is behavior that is not associated with any intent to die, um, but it's associated with ways to get relief from negative emotions. Um, and common, common reasons or common methods of this are cutting is probably the most common scratching. So kids will scratch themselves with either their own fingernails until they draw blood or with other types of sharp items. Um, some kids will engage in head banging, burning themselves. Um, so you see this in various forms and pediatricians probably may be the first people to notice this if you see evidence of cuts or scars during a medical exam. Um, so this is an important thing to be aware of as a risk factor. I don't think there's any, as far as I know, effort in place to do any sort of universal screening or screening for this in primary care. However, this is an important thing, I think, to think about moving forward because of the prevalence and the association with suicide attempts. Um, again, these are some of the common reasons that kids engage in non-suicidal self-injury. And then we know from emerging studies and that non-suicidal self-injury, like I said, is a predictor of future suicide attempts. There was one study, a secondary analysis of a large clinical trial of depressed youth, which found that non-suicidal self-injury was actually a more robust predictor of a subsequent suicide attempt than a past suicide attempt was. Um, we know that most adolescents engage in both behaviors. So it's less common to find a teen who has only made a suicide attempt and never also engaged in non-suicidal self-injury or vice versa. So these are often concurrent. Um, and the, the thinking is why this is a really potent risk factor is because it's almost like when you, if you think about in the substance abuse language, it's like a gateway behavior to a suicide attempt. And in order to attempt suicide, someone has to overcome the kind of innate resistance to harming oneself or their self-protective instinct. And the thinking is that non-suicidal self-injury gets someone more and more comfortable with engaging in self-harm to where they become more capable of um, attempting to, to harm themselves in a lethal manner. Um, and there's another really interesting study looking at trajectory of the emergence of suicide, suicidal ideation, non-suicidal behavior, non-suicidal self-injury behavior, suicide attempts. And they found in a large sample of kids, inpatient and outpatient, that kids are already on average experiencing first suicidal ideation before they ever engage in non-suicidal self-injury. So kids who, the onset of non-suicidal self-injury seems to occur in the context of kids already having thoughts about. Suicide. So that's just something to be aware of that this is a behavior that indicates risk. Okay, so in terms of safety planning strategies and the evidence-based tools that exist to reduce suicide risk, one of the most important ones is lethal means restriction. And the good news is that this is relatively straightforward to do. I, I don't think you need to be a mental health professional to do this. Um, and you guys may already be doing this to some extent, um, but Decreasing access to means is one of the most effective suicide prevention strategies that exists. And that is because a large proportion of suicide attempts are impulsive. And so if the person is in the middle of a crisis of suicidality and they don't have an immediate way to harm themselves, more often than not, that urge will pass and then they will be fine and they will not then you know, engage in going to find something to harm themselves. They could, so this is not foolproof. And when we talk to parents about this who often find this very overwhelming when we start talking about restricting potential means of self-harm, we talk a little bit about um, you know, a metaphor in terms of healthy eating. So if you wanna eat healthy, um, but you have a, a big chocolate cake sitting on the you know, counter in your kitchen, so much more likely that you're just gonna you know, in a, a moment of weakness, just eat that because it's right there. Um, but if it's not there, it's more likely you won't engage in that impulse. Could you go to a store and go buy a cake? Sure, you could. It just takes a lot more steps, a lot more, you know, commitment to that plan. And there's a lot more opportunities to change your mind or have someone notice and intervene along the way. And so that's the principle by which we're talking about restriction of means. Um, 
because parents, again, often feel very overwhelmed. Like, I can't do this. They can always find something. What's the point of doing any of it if, you know, they just go find something else? And so um, I think we get a lot more buy-in and parents feel a lot more comfortable when we talk about we're trying to reduce the risk. It's not, not possible to reduce it 100%. Um, so things that you want to talk to families about removing are number one, guns. Um, so any family in which they have a teen who is thinking about suicide should absolutely not have a firearm in the home and the teen should not have access to firearms. Um, we're, we're fairly lucky, I think, in California that most families on average, I think, do not have a firearm. When I talk with colleagues who work in Texas or other parts of the country, they say, forget it. They all have a gun at home. They're not getting rid of the gun. So they go to um, safe storage of guns. I would say safe storage is an option if you absolutely cannot convince the person to get rid of the gun, but always trying to convince the family to just get the gun out of the home is number one because teens are, are, are good at finding hidden things and figuring out locks and, and trying to get into stuff that they're not supposed to. So the safest thing is just to not have it. And you can always tell parents this statistic. This is from an organization um, at Harvard School of Public Health, Means Matter. 85% of youth under 18 who died by firearm suicide used the family member's gun. So you know, they're getting guns from their parents. And obviously the problem with a gun is if you use it, it's more likely than not to be lethal. So this is, you know, guns are a really important thing to restrict. Um, other things that are important to restrict are um, access to medications and all medications over the counter and prescription. Um, I talk to parents, I don't tell kids this, but I talk to parents separately about the lethality of Tylenol because a lot of people are not aware of that and tell parents to remove all Tylenol containing products. If they need a couple of Advil instead at home, that's fine. And that letting them know that even a small amount of Tylenol can be lethal and it's a medical emergency, which people are not aware. We had a case many years ago, I was aware of at UCLA where a kid I think took 10 Tylenol and didn't tell anyone. And like five days later, was needing a liver transplant eventually. So I don't, I didn't know that that was an issue as a non MD. So that's something I always tell parents about again, like not in front of kids though, because we don't want kids to know that. Um, we tell parents to get rid of sharps or to restrict access to sharps. So knives, scissors, razors, um, and, uh, other things you, which you might also talk about are household poisons, bleach, things like that. Um, restricting access to a large amount of alcohol. And we talk to parents about if they can, it's better to remove these things from the home temporarily and not have them there at all. Because again, teens can find them. Um, however, if they cannot do that or not willing to do that, at least having those things locked up um, and hidden. Again, hiding without locking is not usually very secure. Um, locking up would be better and then total removal would be best. Um, and we work with parents, um, you know, pretty closely to help them do this and to get them on board with why this would be helpful. Um, and this is certainly something I would imagine you could do um, in a pediatric visit as well. Okay, another thing that we do when we think a kid is at risk is we increase parental monitoring. Um, so ideally, we are partners with the parent and collaborating to keep the teen safe. And having the parent, when we think a kid is at elevated risk, to watch the teen, um, to not leave them alone in their room with the door shut for a long time, um, where they're not monitoring for kids who we are worried about suicide risk, particularly um, with kids who might engage in methods like going over to the train tracks or you know, going to a bridge or a high place. The best way to prevent that, obviously you can't move, remove those things, but you cannot let your kid go there or keep make sure you're monitoring them. Um, and so we talk about this monitoring and blocking any windows of opportunity for the teen to be alone, unmonitored, to engage in self-harm. And then we will kind of titrate this to the level of risk that we think is there. Um, so obviously, if a kid is in imminent danger, we just send them to the emergency room. But if they're not quite at that level, but we're concerned, we'll have parents do at times 24-7 monitoring. Um, and when we're doing that, at least in outpatient psychiatry, we'll see them 
usually every day or every day or two to keep evaluating whether this has now risen to the level of the emergency room or whether the risk is starting to decrease and we don't need that. But of course, it's hard for parents to monitor 24 seven for an extended period of time. But sometimes we can get parents to do that and we will often do that um, in the context of our programs in child psychiatry to see if we can potentially get through the crisis without a hospitalization. Um, another evidence-based practice, which is fairly easy to do, is a written safety plan that was developed by um, two psychologists, Barbara Stanley and Greg Brown, um, and actually was part of the original uh, cognitive therapy for suicide attempters work that I did when I was a postdoc with Aaron Beck and Greg Brown a long time ago. And then they took this out of that larger intervention and made it into a standalone intervention. And this is a written safety plan, which has really excellent data supporting its effectiveness. And it's relatively easy to do. Um, you go through with the teen and you identify with them what are warning signs that they might be at risk for suicide uh, or in an imminent suicide crisis. Um, the next step there is what are some coping strategies they can do on their own to try and help reduce risk. So usually people become suicidal in the context of really, really intense negative emotion in that moment. So we go over simple coping strategies they can do to bring their emotions down a little bit where they can keep themselves safe. So things like distracting themselves, calling a friend, going for a walk. Um, the next step there is who people, who are people they can call um, to spend time with who help them feel better and are distracting for them. Next in line is this hierarchical, it's people who they can call for help or ask for help. Um, and then after that is the local emergency numbers. And then finally, the last thing is what needs to be done in terms of restriction of access to means to keep the environment safe. And this is a standard template that is used. Um, in our clinic, we have one that we have uh, adapted to already include, let's see if I can use this pointer, the um, emergency numbers for our local area. So this is already written in. Um, and then you can see it's the same thing here. And you just go through this with kids step by step. Um, I usually have the kids take a picture of it so they have it on their phone. Um, we encourage them to have a copy with them at all times, we'll share it with the parent so the parent understands what the safety plan is. There's probably an app for this now. I'm, I'm less up to date on apps. But there's probably a way to just put it into a phone directly. And what we communicate is that when someone is in a suicidal crisis and overwhelmed with really intense emotion, they're not gonna be able to think clearly enough to say, oh, okay, what was I supposed to do when I'm in a crisis? Or what did my therapist say? They just need the plan written down. So all they have to remember is just read your plan. So this is sort of an advanced plan. And then when they're in the crisis, there's no you know, executive functioning needed. All they have to remember is read the plan. Um, another thing, oh, the data for that, so th this is, there's studies going on now testing this specifically in clinical trials for teens, but the clinical trials with adults showed some really robust data. They looked at this in um, VA emergency departments across nine different departments with a really large sample of patients, like over a thousand patients. Um, and they compared doing this safety plan in the ER versus not and they found that it decreased uh, future suicide attempts by about 50%. So this is pretty low investment and quick to do for a potential 50% reduction in um, suicide attempts. In addition to that, another thing that we do, again, this is pretty straightforward, easy to do, which also originally comes from this cognitive therapy for adult suicide attempters intervention, but I actually think it it it's more kid friendly than it is in some ways adult friendly, but it's this idea of a Hope box, and this is sort of another tool so the kid does not have to engage in any problem solving or um, you know, thinking when they're in a crisis. They just get this box, which we call a hope box, which they've created in advance, where they put in different tools they can use for coping um, and self-soothing, as well as reminders of reasons to live. And then when they are suicidal, all they have to do is get this box and they have everything all set up. So Kids will put things in there, like if they like to do art, they'll put art supplies in there. Um, if they really love their dog and 
their dog is a reason to live, put a picture of the dog in there. We'll have them put a copy of the safety plan in there too, but they'll construct these boxes. Um, and then it's another tool to have accessible. And here's a, this is an example I found on the internet. This is not from a real patient, but you can get some idea that kids have fun with this, picking out a container that they wanna put it in and putting their things in there. And it's actually really, we assign it for homework in our adolescent safety assessment program, and then they bring it back the next time. And it's a really nice experience, I think, between um, a clinician and the team, because you really learn a lot about the team when they come and they show you all their stuff. And you know they often have pictures of their friends and the things that interest them. And I think it's a nice moment and a chance to also really reinforce the teen's strengths um, and reasons to live. Um, these are some handouts we go over from DBT, Dialectical Behavior Therapy, which I'll talk about um, a little bit more later. But this is a million ways a person could distract themselves when they are in a crisis. Um, so when the kids say they can't think of anything, we say, well, that's no problem because we have a handout here with you know a million things on it. So there's got to be at least one thing there you can do. And we talk to the kids about Think of things that when you do them, you get so engrossed in it, you kind of lose track of time or you're really focused because we want you to have something that's going to get your mind off of suicidal thoughts or whatever is you're thinking about related to the crisis. So your emotions have a chance to just settle down a couple of notches where you can make a safe choice for yourself versus not. So, and if they, you know, if they can't think of anything, or even if they can't all often add, something you can do is counting backwards from 100, you know, saying the alphabet backwards, because that takes some mental energy and then that, that blocks them from thinking about suicide or whatever the triggers are at the same time and gives them just a couple minutes to settle down where, again, they can make a safe choice and avoid an impulsive um, self-harm behavior. So there's another handout about self-soothing tools. Again, these are things like you know, light a scented candle, or cuddle up with a soft blanket or things that uh, help reduce emotions because they're soothing versus distracting. So we have them put a lot of these kinds of tools in those hope boxes also. Skip that. Um, it's important for any kid who at, is at risk and parents to have these emergency numbers. So this is again like the most basic safety planning. But I think the the most the best numbers to give families now are this 988. Suicide Crisis Lifeline. This has replaced the former, uh, whatever it was, 1-800-something talk, which was the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. Now it's 988 and everything goes there. I have not called this myself to see how well it works, but everything is supposed to go through 988 now. Um, and then the other is Crisis Text Line, because we all know that teens like to text sometimes more than they like to actually talk to somebody. So they can text this line and someone will respond right away and then follow up by phone and try and assess risk. So these are really good um, numbers to give to all the families where the kids are at risk. Back when we were mostly in person before the pandemic, we had these little business size cards with these numbers on it that we'd give everyone to put in their wallets. Um, when we've been on Zoom, we just show parents and teens this and tell them, I tell them to take a picture or a screenshot. Um, but these are good numbers to hand out. Um, another thing that's really important is to try and do some education with parents about the seriousness of suicidality. So I think for parents, it's, you know, for a lot of reasons, it can be easy to minimize the seriousness of this behavior. Um, and assume that the, the kid is not at risk. I think parents often feel manipulated by this behavior. Um, you know, if you don't let me go to my friend's house, I'm going to kill myself. As a parent, that, that feels, quote unquote, manipulative. Um, so I think parents often, um, you know, don't take those comments seriously, or they see it as attention seeking. That's a term that gets used a lot. Um, and the danger with that is that that really minimizes the risk that's actually associated with these behaviors, as well as it, it's judgmental and critical. So if somebody tells you that you're manipulating, oh, you don't really mean that, you're just seeking attention, you're probably not going to continue to disclose to that person or ask them for help. And it's really important that teens see their parent as someone they can go to for help, because the parent is the you know, most likely person to be there 
uh, when there's a suicidal crisis. And it's really important that teens feel comfortable being honest with their parents and going to their parents for help. Um, so we really want to educate parents on the seriousness of this. Kids don't usually talk about this if they haven't had some thoughts about doing it. Kids who are saying they're suicidal are not generally making this up or just pretending to be suicidal to, you know, get what they want. And even if they were doing that, I'd be pretty concerned about that being the way they were doing it. And we know that there's a lot of contagion, even just around the terms suicide and self-harm. So if someone's thinking about it, they're increasing their risk of doing it. Um, and so we talked to parents about making sure to take every statement about suicidality seriously. Don't dismiss it. You know, in the event you have an overreaction, that's better than having an underreaction and potentially having the kid seriously injure themselves. Um, and so we do education around that um, and talk about reduction of family conflict in general, again, with the goal being that the kid feels really comfortable going to the parent for help, because often the parent is going to be the one who is there and who is able to help them if there's a crisis. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the kind of lay of the land with treatment for adolescents at risk for suicide. So despite the fact that it's such a huge problem, there's not a lot of data out there on effective treatment. So as of the last time I checked, there's seven randomized controlled trials that have shown treatments with an impact on reducing um, self-harm behavior. And so these are, these are treatments that have had one randomized controlled trial. There's only seven of them. Um, they range in feasibility of actually doing them. So multi-systemic therapy was something that was originally developed for juvenile delinquency. It's a very intensive treatment that requires a whole team of people to work together and go to the home. Um, and it's a great treatment, but it's, it's not very feasible at all to do. Um, and it has not been adopted in any sort of widespread way for suicidality. Um, there was something on a group therapy approach that actually was attempted to be replicated and failed to replicate. That was a, um, a brief group intervention. Mentalization is a psychodynamic or psychoanalytic treatment, which is more widespread in the UK, but hasn't been used as much here. Um, there's a, a CBT approach for uh, comorbid substance abuse and suicidality. There's dialectical behavior therapy, which I'm going to talk more about, which is what I specialize in. There was one really great study um, where they, in Australia, where they did a brief depression psychoeducation intervention with just parents, and they added in some tips about suicidality, and they found that it decreased suicidality in the teens, even though they didn't meet with the teens at all. So getting the parents more educated and skilled um, appears to have a protective effect for teens. And I'm doing a couple of studies now using dialectical behavior therapy parenting to see how much mileage we can get, again, out of getting parents skilled to deal with things at home to reduce risk in teens um, to help when teens have difficulty engaging in treatment or when people can't get to treatment right away. If we can get the parents skilled, we can make an impact there. And then there's a treatment that my colleague at UCLA, Joan Asarno, developed, um, which is a brief, more crisis-oriented treatment, um, looking at uh, some different coping tools from different therapies together. Again, the only, the only treatment right now that is considered a well-established treatment, which in psychology um, means been uh, replicated in two large-scale, well-designed, randomized controlled trials, the only treatment that meets that bar right now is what's called dialectical behavior therapy. Um, and there's two studies supporting that. So one that was done in Norway, and then a second one that was done in the United States, of which I was one of the principal investigators of. This was a large multi-site study, which was done when I was still in Los Angeles and also done in Seattle at the University of Washington. And that study also showed that DBT was more effective than another type of therapy that's commonly done um, in clinical practice, supportive therapy at reducing suicide attempts and non-suicidal self-injury. So again, despite the nature of the problem, we don't have a lot of great tools in terms of ongoing treatment. And right now, DBT has the most evidence to support it. Um, 
across those treatments that I showed you, the ones that have randomized controlled trials, there are some common elements of what makes a treatment for suicidal youth effective. So if you're looking for potential referrals for patients, some things to think about is um, treatments that involve detailed safety planning, like what I went over, um, family-based components. So again, we know family conflict is a big risk factor for adolescent suicide, and we really need the parents to learn tools to keep the teens safe. So a treatment that has family-based components. Most treatments that are effective for suicidal youth are transdiagnostic. So, you know, earlier on, there used to be thinking, well, if someone's depressed and you treat depression, get them less depressed, they'll stop being suicidal. And I think people learned that that was not the most effective way to go, that suicidal behavior or non-suicidal self-injury is sort of its own thing. And the person needs a treatment specifically targeting that and specific tools to reduce those behaviors. They won't just go away on their own if the overall disorder goes away. And also depression is not the only presentation that we see. So there's, there's many different symptoms that are related to suicidality. Um, usually the treatments that are effective are more comprehensive. While it would be nice to have a you know, brief three month treatment that worked, that is not usually what happens clinically. These kids are very complex um, and have multiple comorbid uh, psychopathology going on and it takes time and in involvement of, of you know, multiple people and modalities of treatment. Um, and then obviously the treatments target risk factors for suicidality in teens like depressed mood, motion dysregulation, family, brain, things like that. So let me just tell you a little bit about DBT and then I'm going to make sure we leave time for questions. So DBT is what's called a cognitive behavioral treatment. It's mainly a behavioral treatment. So it focuses on teaching new behaviors like coping skills, as well as trying to understand reinforcers or things that are maintaining problem behaviors. And it really focuses on emotion dysregulation as being the core issue that is leading to self-harm behavior. And the idea is that people engage in self-harm behavior when they are experiencing really, really intense negative emotion and don't have any other way that they are finding effective to help themselves feel better. And so self-harm becomes a tool for doing that, for reducing negative affect, or when the person is also feeling very hopeless that I'm feeling you know, horrible now, my emotions are intolerable, and I'm never going to feel any different then the idea of suicide becomes, you know, starts to make sense to them as a coping strategy. And so DBT teaches a lot of different skills for managing intense emotions. So teens have effective ways to help themselves feel better that are safe versus using non-suicidal self-injury or suicide attempts. Um, DBT is a multi-component treatment. So it has individual therapy. It has a multi-family skills group, meaning the kids come along with their parents and they're all in a group of teens and parents. And we teach them all skills. So the parents are learning the skills too, both so they can coach their teens as well as so they can manage their own intense emotions that they are struggling with given the struggles their teen is having. Um, all the therapists are in a meeting each week because it's very stressful and emotionally dysregulating for us to be managing all these high risk patients. So we have a meeting where everyone makes sure we're all staying, um, you know, in accordance with the treatment protocols, as well, as, as well as helping each other solve challenging issues when they come up. And then the kids and parents get access to the therapist 24-7 uh, by phone. So we can coach them on how to use skills in the middle of a real life crisis, because often the crisis is not occurring when they're at the therapy session with you. It's later when you're not there and they don't know how to use the tool. So that's a time when they can call us to really generalize using these skills right in the moment when they need to be practicing them and using them to be safe. And then of course we meet with families um, and parents as needed to get them um, learning and using skills for their team. I'm gonna skip this interest of time. So in DBT, we also um, focus on helping the teens build a life worth living um, because often when they are experiencing depression or other types of painful mood you know, all the time, they start to feel that it's not worth it to be alive. And that's the kind of thinking that we really want to change so, to reduce suicide risk. So we'll focus on what are their goals? What are things that make life worth living for them and really try and help them achieve those things? Uh, 
Um, and just tell you, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the programs that we have at Stanford for suicidal youth. Of course, we have limited capacity to take kids in these programs, so um, be aware of that. But what we have here is we have our adolescent safety assessment program, which is for kids um, and families who contact child psychiatry with self-harm or suicidality as the primary presenting problem. We have a, a four-session safety planning program going over the tools that I went over with you, where we work with the teens and parents to give them these safety tools, enhance safety planning, um, make treatment recommendations, and then we have case managers who work with us to help link these kids to ongoing care in the community. Um, we have our DBT program. So uh, the program is set up just like I showed you in those other slides. It's a multi-component treatment program. It's six months long. And so we have a, a DBT program at Stanford. Um, there's also an IOP program that we have, an intensive outpatient program that we do in consultation with Children's Health Council, which is a community mental health center in Palo Alto. And so for kids who need to be seen more frequently every day, a couple hours a day, we have embedded the evidence-based DBT protocol into that program for teens who need that level of care. And then there's other things going on that I am not personally involved in, but the inpatient service at Mills Peninsula Hospital, Stanford has a section of that unit that is led by Stanford. Um, and we have a lot of kids go back and forth there between our other programs. Um, there's things in the community that are being done, Stanford Center for Youth Mental Health and Wellbeing. There's partnerships with schools. Um, and in the community, and then obviously different research programs. If you wanted to refer someone to the DBT program, you can contact me or you can have families call our main child psychiatry number. Um, if you wanna refer them to our IOP program, it's called the RISE program. Oops. That's how you refer them. Um, again, be mindful that uh, these programs often have a waiting list. And then if you need, if you want to contact me for anything after this talk about patient or questions, um, that you can email me. Um, and I think I will stop here to take questions. Thank you. Let's see if we have questions here. Okay. Oh, so great talk. And those are wondering if you can comment the broader topic of suicide prevention in terms of and you showed at the beginning you know, what we all know suicide rates are, are going up exponentially in young adults teens so I, I could make a case naturally that we're failing suicide prevention failing miserably and so you know one of the things the u.s preventive services task force grappled with is is screening even effective and, you know we're removing maybe screening the wrong population and even things you provided are when they're acutely suicidal, but I'm wondering if you could come back to what can we do to reverse those curves because these are sort of, you're describing things that are very end stage, but it doesn't seem like we're really getting at the root cause of the problems here. What's causing the suicide? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And my work is definitely focused on when they've already got acute suicidality. So the, the kids we've already identified as being at risk. I mean, it's hard to know larger scale in terms of, you know, prevention before they get suicidal, what would be most effective. I think people are studying more um, kind of emotion regulation skills training in kids. Like some people have studied programs at schools to try and give kids tools for regulating emotions early on so they don't end up suicidal. I think there it would be really helpful if there was more um, public awareness of some of these really basic safety strategies, like, you know, if you know someone at risk for suicide, make sure you, you know, don't have a gun in your home or just these basic safety tools. I think that would also go a long way, but that doesn't get done sort of in a public service campaign kind of way. I mean, there, you know, it's, it's a broad question. There's a lot of perspectives. I mean, I think with the adolescents I've worked with, you know, compared to thinking about when I was a teen or what our country at least was like then. I mean, I think it's harder to get into college. The kids see a lot less hope and, and possibility for the future, which is challenging. Um, so I don't know. There's probably a lot of forces at, at play 
you know, my, my focus again is more on the treatment end, but I think more kids getting more coping tools for managing emotions and then more, more parents and people having more information about just basic safety things would go a long way. Let's take a question from uh, online. Uh, it's by Dr. Golden. Uh, they're using the PHQ-9 as a uh, screening tool. Uh, should they replace that with what you're proposing? Um, that's a great question. I, and I just looked at the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations yesterday, and they do recommend using the ASQ instead of the PHQ-9, but there's actually on the website, a combined PHQ-9 ASQ measure. So I might suggest taking a look at that. I haven't looked at it yet. And then the um, inpatient pediatric units here have been using the ASQ for suicide risk. Just be aware of in case there's an interest in being consistent across. So I think that PHQ-9 question is really general. That's what difficult to ask about suicidal ideation, but it doesn't give you any nuance as to what level of intervention you need right then. So the ASQ gives you a little more information to go on. Thank you. We have a question. Hi. Thanks for the talk. I had a question about the example you gave. Oh. I had a question about the example you gave related to uh, like when to be concerned about suicidality and if a child said something like, I'm going to kill myself if you don't let me do this. Um, in adult psychiatry, I think of that as sort of a low risk suicidal threat because you would categorize it as conditional suicidality, which like is typically not going to be acted upon. Is conditional suicidality also low risk in children and adolescents or is that still something you would consider like much more high risk compared to in the adult population? I mean, I, I would consider that a concern in a, a teen or an adult because, again, you know, making a comment like that to me shows that someone is thinking about suicide. I mean, they could threaten all sorts of things, but they've chosen suicide and they've put some level of thought into that. So I think that we really, um, again, tell parents, at least with teens, any comment like that, should you should assume the teen is suicidal. And if they're not, fine, you, you did more than you needed to, but if they are, which I think more often than not, there is something real in that, then you can get a more thorough assessment done by a clinician um, and determine if there's risk. I mean, there's, you know, that, that comment is also just so general, it's hard to know without doing more assessment of what that really means for a kid. But I, again, I, I found it rare that there's kids saying, I'm going to kill myself if I can't do this, who are not actually thinking about killing themselves. Thank you. We'll take questions. We'll take questions from online. So since the statistics that you mentioned include the individual all the way to 24 years of age, any thoughts about restricting uh, access to firearms and purchasing firearms in this age group? Well, I, I don't personally think anyone should be able to purchase firearms. So I'm, I'm anti-firearm for everybody. Um, I think that age, the kind of transitional age youth, as, as we call it in psychiatry, um, is really, really challenging, um, especially the college age kids, because, again, now they're, you know, technically an adult. Uh, you, you need permission to talk to adults about them to keep them safe, and they're still high risk and developing their um, executive functioning skills. So I don't know that there is a great answer for how to deal with that age group and restriction of means. When I have kids that age, I usually tell them that part of us working together is you have to sign permission for me to talk to parents, because if I'm worried about you, we need to mobilize everybody to keep you safe. And, you know, I'm not going to engage in a agreement with you where I'm not going to talk to people to keep you safe. And obviously, we have a legal ability to break confidentiality in an extreme imminent danger situation. But I work with teens that before we get to that point, we also need to involve adults who can keep you safe. Um, I mean, I know you all probably know better than me, but I don't know what California has in place in the emergency room if you can identify someone as not um, being able to purchase a firearm for a certain amount of time if they've been seen for psychiatric reason. I know other states are working on initiatives where people can 
block someone's ability to get a firearm if they've been suicidal, I think that would be a great tool to have. I don't know what we have here. Do you, Antonio? <laughs> okay, that's that's a great tool also. Thank you. You had a question here? No, okay. So um, back to online. So insurance companies sometimes severely limit the number of therapy sessions and inpatient stays that are paid for. Is there any correlation with outcome? The shorter, shorter therapy or shorter inpatient stays? Uh, limiting the number of uh, sessions or limiting the number of days on inpatient unit and the uh, outcome. I, I'm not aware of research studies looking at that exact issue. And I think there's a lot of um, research or focus on like the length of treatments and what's an effective length. I think we know from our work on DBT, which is a six month long treatment that only about 50% of kids are in remission from self-harm at the end of that, suggesting it should be longer than that. So I, you know, and these kids who are really are chronically suicidal or have made suicide attempts, again, the, the cases are very complex. It's pretty unrealistic to think that there's going to be any lasting change in anything very brief. So I would say I, I'm i sure that the briefer the treatment, the poorer the outcome, except for the kids who are on the much milder end. But I'm not aware off the top of my head of any research studies looking at that issue. And again, I think there's a push from NIMH to try and find really brief interventions, but I just don't know that that's realistic for any long-term change. On the inpatient side, I think we, we've we had the ridiculous request over the years. I remember uh, getting approval for 12 hours stay on the inpatient unit. So basically you have to make a decision whether the individual will need to stay a little bit longer or not within 12 hours and argue for any additional days. Um, but that's definitely our impression and it's not uh, any scientific, it's correlated with a higher rate of reoccurrence of the individual coming back to the inpatient unit for, with, for another suicidal attempts or an intensive suicidal ideations. Very good. Okay, questions from the audience? But adolescents also seem to have a time where it's like very precarious, things change quickly, and we might not be able to capture everything in one visit. And we will have to wait until the next year to do Has there been any about incorporating like a biannual visit for teens or making the like well child check? That's a really good question. I, I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, I'm trying to think of the, there was something in the American Academy of Pediatrics um, guidelines about how frequently to screen. And if I remember correctly, it was if someone screens positive to try and bring them back sooner so you can check in. Um, but yeah, in terms of frequency of visits for adolescents, I, I don't know that area. Do you? Okay, but that's a great question. Thank so, you. Uh, and on the on our side, we always wonder in terms of how pediatricians do their jobs. So anyway, that's a very good idea in terms of for some uh, patients, some adolescent, maybe a biannual visits will probably be indicated. Um, I'm mindful of the time. We have several um, additional questions. Thank you all for your interest, and thank you, Dr. Burke, for this very informative uh, lecture. For the questions who are online, we'll try to answer them online. And um, without, uh, since we have, don't have, do we have a question here? Do you want? Okay. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.